Hey everyone, so it's time to talk about Sanji. Out of all the Straw Hats, he's definitely the one whose standing or popularity or general perception has fallen the most in the eyes of the community since the time skip, and it's gotten to a point where a lot of readers seem to think that Oda may be deliberately ruining the character, that Oda may be kind of knocking him down in terms of general importance, that Oda doesn't care about giving him good moments anymore, or that Oda even hates Sanji. And to start with, I will say no, I don't actually believe that Oda hates this character or that some weird change has come over him where now he randomly enjoys dragging Sanji through the mud. I think Sanji is and always will be one of Oda's favorite characters, but I want to talk about why, some, why, why things have gotten to a point where some readers feel that Oda may actually hate Sanji. Why is it that it feels like Sanji has been getting the short end of the stick since the time skip? And really, why am I confident that Sanji will be written back to his former glory by the end of the Wano arc. To me, first and foremost, it starts with examining the, the, the primary appeal of the character. What did we come to expect of Sanji before that feels like it's missing today? So here, I'm actually not going to talk much about Sanji's actual personality traits, not because they don't matter as part of his appeal as a character, but because I don't think Sanji as a person has been written too differently pre to post time skip. For example, if your favorite aspect of Sanji was his uh, chivalry, for example, then that's no problem. Right from Punk Hazard on, we got to see that shine. And really just in general, Whole Cake Island pretty much exclusively highlighted his personality traits. Now, since I don't think that day-to-day -day personality has anything to do with why people feel Sanji is being ruined, let's set that aside and look at everything else that makes up the, the primary appeal of Sanji's character and then get into why a lot of that is arguably missing post time skip. So to start with, a big, big, big part of why Sanji is as popular as he is, is that he is one of the top three fighters in the crew. He generally gets the third most action highlights in the crew, and since we are primarily following the Straw Hats, that means he is the third most highlighted fighter in the entire series. Now, let me get this out of the way real quick. That is in no way a shallow reason for liking a character, you know, that they're strong, because most pe people naturally like characters who have high impact in a story. It's the same way that people are more drawn to, you know, extremely smart characters in a show like House of Cards, because that's a show where intelligence matters way more than your physical strength, and so more intelligent characters are generally going to have a higher impact and be more capable than other characters. So similarly, in an action series like One Piece, it just so happens that fighting ability does matter quite a bit, and so strong characters are naturally going to be more high impact, they're going to have bigger moments, they're going to have a higher standing on average, they're going to have the respect of other characters. It's natural to like characters like that because a lot of characters we really like are often those we wish we could be like to a degree. And more importantly, people don't just like characters for being strong. It's not like, I don't think most people are like, who's the strongest character, that's gonna be my favorite. If that were the case, then Luffy would be everyone's favorite character in the Straw Hats, and Gold Roger would be everyone's favorite character in the series. So, while Sanji is one of the three main fighters of the crew, and while he does get a large amount of action spotlight among the crew, there's a lot of other facets that go into what makes, you know, one fighter character more appealing than another. So again, what is the primary appeal of Sanji in this case? Like, among the crew, why do some readers like Sanji better than Luffy or Zoro? To start with, I'd say even though Sanji is extremely strong and he's one of the three quote-unquote monsters of the crew, he's not really a dumb fight-obsessed meathead like Luffy and Zoro. As such, really the differentiator, I think, is that when Sanji is portrayed at his absolute best, it's a completely unique vibe where Sanji gets this sort of cool, suave, James Bond type of portrayal. And forget Luffy and Zoro, Sanji's really the only character in all of One Piece that gets this type of portrayal. Pre-time skip that especially shined through when Oda had Sanji spearhead a lot of his own missions, independent of the rest of the crew, that usually came up really, really big. Sometimes he would have another Straw Hat as his accomplice, but it was always his show executing his plan. And these Sanji covert ops missions definitely felt a lot more sort of intelligent, again, a lot more James Bond-esque than what you would expect from Luffy or Zoro. Not to mention a lot of really memorable character-defining moments came out of these missions. Big moments that probably contributed a lot to Sanji's primary appeal as a character, kind of giving him his own personal brand of badass that you don't really see from the other Straw Hats. 
And that's something that I think a lot of people really vibed with. And along those lines, Oda also generally wrote Sanji as the most clutch straw hat. Pre-time skip, Oda loved writing Sanji as the guy that would maybe be on the sidelines for a while and then pop up out of nowhere to make a big save. And a lot of the coolest Sanji moments are exactly that. Like, look throughout the series, coming in super clutch to save the entire crew and conclude the Mr. Prince storyline, coming in out of nowhere again to save Vivi when she was being hunted down by Mr. Two by herself, again when saving Usopp out of nowhere to take the hit from NL while simultaneously ruining NL's plans, and yet again saving Usopp's life last minute out of nowhere from Jaibura with the big heroic entrance. I think pre-time skip Sanji has by far the most memorable last minute arrivals to save the day. Like, if you did a quick comparison, I'd say pre-time skip Luffy, you know, he arrived on Pell to save Vivi one time, and then Nightmare Luffy saved Usopp and Nami, but those were really the only two out of nowhere, last minute save type moments by Luffy, even though he's the main character and gets way more screen time in fights than Sanji. And that's simply because, you know, they're written differently, Luffy is more like a force of nature. When he's on his way, it's like a storm is coming, like he generally doesn't just show up out of nowhere. Similarly with Zoro, I think, you know, with Zoro you could count, uh, I guess, Orange Town where he saved Nami, and much later in Thriller Bark with Brooke, but generally speaking, Oda doesn't really play up these last minute rescue type moments with the other two monster trio members as much as he does with Sanji. And that's nothing on Luffy and Zoro, it just seems like Oda likes to keep a certain type of badass moment reserved for Sanji, while Luffy and Zoro definitely have their own type that I could list a bunch of, basically. So, generally speaking, with Oda having Sanji go off to do his independent plans, uh, Oda having Sanji come in with clutch saves at the last minute, I think a large part of Sanji's primary appeal for the first half of the series was that he, frequent, he frequently got to shine as a sort of hidden ace of the crew. Now, when looking at how readers feel about pre- and post-time skip Sanji, I think a lot of the dissatisfaction stems from the sense that Sanji's primary appeal as a character has been missing, or not quite right in the post-time skip. So to start with, let's look at Sanji's status as the third strongest straw hat post-time skip. Now technically that has not changed, among the crew he has kept his status as top three, and the monster trio was honestly being highlighted more than ever at the start of the post time skip. But the difference is that as the new world progressed, it no longer became just about the crew. Now we're in a much bigger world with a lot more strong allies entering the mix. So before, the monster trio felt like very elite company to be in, and the fact that Sanji was in this elite group despite not even being as fight obsessed or as much of a meathead as Luffy and Zoro was pretty cool. But now there's so many characters coming in and out of each arc fighting alongside the Straw Hats that the idea of being on the level of the monster trio is just much less special. In fact, allies who may be as strong as or even stronger than Sanji are now pretty much a dime a dozen. Basically, Sanji's still number three in the crew, but that just feels a lot less important in the grand scheme of things now. It's not like pre-time skip where the crew could walk into places like Drum or Alabasta or Thriller Bark or wherever, and you could confidently expect that Sanji was the third strongest good guy in any given arc. Like, looking at all the powerhouses in the Wano Alliance, it's hard to even say where Sanji falls exactly until he actually proves his standing by, for example, getting a big win, like defeating Queen or something, at least as many people believe. Now, beyond that, we also have yet to see Sanji get to showcase a lot of what made him unique in the past. We haven't really had any of those major independent Sanji missions where he goes kind of rogue and executes a big plan on his own to save the day. Those were plot lines that gave Sanji some of his absolute most iconic moments, and that probably really drew a lot of people into becoming Sanji fans, and Oda has not written one of these type of plot lines for him yet in the New World. Similarly, Sanji, who was the master of clutch, out of nowhere saves, pre-time skip, has not done that in as satisfying a manner post-time skip. To be fair, it doesn't feel like Oda has forgotten about these type of clutch moments, as he had moments like Sanji flying in out of nowhere to stop Virgo, and flying in out of nowhere to stop Doflamingo. Both of the actual moments where he arrives are great, but what's different from pre-time skip is what happens afterwards that arguably makes them less satisfying. Before, generally when Sanji had his heroic rescues, the whole incident afterwards could be chalked up as a big, satisfying win for him. Now, you can interpret the Virgo fight however you want, Maybe Sanji would have won if it continued, we don't know, but at the very least he was having some trouble, it wasn't really a satisfying win. Then later down the line, against Doflamingo he had an even more definitive loss. 
and obviously that makes sense, Doflamingo was the main villain of the arc. But the fact is that similar moments Oda wrote pre-time skip ended up making Sanji look really good in the end, whereas post-time skip these clutch moments only really make for cool arrivals, but not exactly something Sanji fans can hang their hat on afterwards. And when I say Oda would make these heroic rescues come out as big wins for Sanji, I don't even li literally mean win as in win a fight. For example, pre-time skip Sanji made a last minute save only to get destroyed by Enel, but despite the fact that Sanji couldn't beat Enel in a fight, it still felt like he had actually seriously gotten the better of NL overall by sabotaging NL's plans. So even in a loss, Sanji came away looking really good, which has not been the result of his post-time skip heroic attempts. On top of that, these two moments do give me the sense that Oda is using Sanji a bit as a sort of sacrificial lamb, simply to show how strong the big bad of the arc is. Sanji getting wrecked by NL wasn't really a big deal since NL was literally unbeatable to everyone except Luffy, so it was actually really a big win that Sanji managed to give NL a setback in any way at all. But with Virgo and Doflamingo, it just becomes more blatant over the course of the arc that look, look, other protagonists can do better against these guys than Sanji can. And again, that goes back a little to the fact that third strongest on the Straw Hat crew is just starting to feel less and less significant in the grander scheme of things. Lastly, I think we are still waiting on a major Sanji fight. There are instances you can point to a Sanji having a good showing, but even like for example against page 1, we didn't get to see the victory, I'd argue it was an implied victory, and it doesn't seem like it had a long term effect. Now with all that being said, if you're a Sanji fan, I wouldn't worry. Because while it seems we have been in an extended period of Sanji having it kind of rough, this is actually not the first time this has happened. In fact. Pre-time skip, Sanji would often go through these sort of cycles where for a long period of time, his portrayal suffers a little bit and he doesn't really get any big wins. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this as I see it. I think Oda does generally like to hype Luffy and Zoro a little more on average, simply because their characters are all about striving for greatness, being fighters, etc. As such, Oda has always been a little more okay with just using Sanji as a measuring stick to show that other characters are strong, you know, sometimes or oftentimes at Sanji's expense. And we may see Sanji randomly struggle in ways that Oda probably wouldn't have Luffy or Zoro struggle, even if later down the line we are made to realize that Sanji is stronger than he was being portrayed earlier. And along those lines, Oda may make sure to take the time to write scenes that continually reaffirm Luffy and Zoro's strength, but he may let it slide for Sanji sometimes, such as during Skypiea when all of the monster trio got embarrassed early on by Wiper due to the oxygen change, but Oda made sure to give Luffy and Zoro rematches with Wiper later on, just not Sanji. And just generally, Sanji has always had bigger gaps in time between when he gets his major fights or major feats than Luffy and Zoro. Like they will get their fights and achievements more frequently. But and here's the most important thing, despite Oda being the most lax with Sanji's portrayal out of the monster trio in general and letting Sanji go through these extended periods of time where he may be getting the least shine, Oda always has the awareness to rectify this in a major way when the time comes. Like, it's easy to forget, but after Arlong Park, all the way to Alabasta, Sanji does not get any wins or cool feats like Luffy and Zoro, and in fact, he is often sidelined or made like a joke during this time. Then we got the entire Mr. Prince plotline, which basically made up for everything beforehand, and it was capped off with him getting a big fight against Mr. Two to re-establish his strength. After that, not really any good showings as a fighter at all throughout all of Skypiea, and even during Water 7 for most of the Sea Train fight. Longtime readers will know it had gotten to the point that during the Sea Train battle, most readers thought that Frankie was stronger than Sanji, because he was very much being portrayed like that and through all of Water 7 as well beforehand. Frankie was the first person to even beat a CP9 member while Sanji was fighting a guy who shot noodles out of his nose. And then Oda fixed all that with the Jayabura fight, and it was again cemented that look, Sanji is right up there with Luffy and Zoro. So bottom line, it has always always been the case that Sanji's portrayal may suffer a little bit for a while, not necessarily because Oda dislikes him, but because I think he cares more about highlighting Luffy and Zoro as fighters in general, because that is more important to their characters. And so sometimes Sanji is just going to draw the short straw, basically. But Oda always makes sure to make up for that by giving him a huge win that reaffirms his status at some point, as well as his own missions that are unique to him that allow him to shine in a way that no other straw hat can. It's just that in the new world, I feel like the cycle I'm talking about has been taking a lot longer than normal. 
As I've talked about in past videos, the New World has mostly been just a lot of build-up storylines leading up to the big climax storyline, the Wanawar. This is the arc where we can probably expect major fights for the Straw Hats, new bounties, and hopefully big moments for most of the crew. As such, this is the arc where I would expect the usual return to form for Sanji, because Oda has always had the awareness that if Sanji goes through extended periods without many feats or big moments or chances to shine, maybe even getting disrespected a little bit, to then finally give him some really big wins out of nowhere that kind of re-established the status quo with what readers generally expect from him. And really, I think the crew in general is going to take a huge step forward by the end of the arc. So by the end of this, I would expect that being third on the Straw Hat Pirates would once again mean something pretty significant in the world at large. And really, just in general from everything we've seen, by the end of the story, being top three on the Pirate King's crew is going to be a really, really big deal. So I am confident that there will come a time when being part of the monster trio is really going to mean something and feel elite again. And lastly, while I think that Oda is generally aware of the cycle he puts Sanji through, I think where his awareness may have been lacking in the New World is just how long this cycle has been this time. Even if Oda does have some big wins planned for Sanji and Wano, considering the sheer length of time it's taken to get to this arc, Oda may not have realized that this is an extremely long period to test readers' patience for waiting on classic moments for their favorite character. And here I'll quickly address Whole Cake Island, where you could argue that, look, that was an arc where there were many great Sanji moments, but again, these were more character-based. Now, I personally really liked a lot of what Oda did with Sanji in Whole Cake Island, and you can actually check out my video specifically on Sanji in Whole Cake Island after this. But at the same time, I think an author does need to keep in mind what a character's primary appeal to the reader is in the first place. The fact is, readers had been waiting on a lot of traditionally great Sanji moments for hundreds and hundreds of chapters. And so when Hoke Galen, the arc that was finally going to focus on Sanji came around, and it did not give us any of the traditional Sanji greatness, and was instead much more character trait driven, the storyline became a lot less satisfying than many Sanji fans may have expected. So basically, in my opinion, what Oda did with Sanji in Whole Cake Island was great in isolation, but it also wasn't really what readers were waiting on for Sanji in the grand scheme of things. I think something as simple as giving Sanji a fight like Zoro vs. Pika or even Zoro vs. Monet in the 200 chapters before Whole Cake Island would have satisfied what readers wanted in terms of the primary appeal of Sanji, and then made them a lot more open to a more character-focused storyline afterwards. Instead, I think for a lot of Sanji fans, it was harder to enjoy Whole Cake Island for trying something new with the character, when it had already been hundreds and hundreds of chapters since they had gotten anything they traditionally enjoyed about the character. And to anyone who says that authors shouldn't be criticized because readers had the wrong expectations, because I have heard people say that before, uh, I'd say it depends. I think that that's true sometimes, but really it's a case-by-case -case basis, because the fact is that lots of times, authors are clearly and deliberately responsible for setting readers' expectations and then it is on the author if they fail to deliver. For example, at this point, it is fair to expect, based on everything that's happened in the series so far, it is fair to expect that Zoro will generally get to fight the strongest subordinate of a given arc, and Oda should be fully aware that he has created that expectation among readers, and that has now become one of the main reasons that readers really like that character. And yes, you can criticize Oda if for the rest of the series, he were to suddenly stop giving Zoro the strongest subordinate and instead had him fight the weakest subordinate every time. But again, everything that's happening with Sanji so far does seem like it fits the usual cycle of him going through extended periods without big wins or big moments, and then Oda having him come back in a big way. It's just that the cycle feels a lot longer this time. Based on the past, Sanji should be getting a big boost in portrayal towards the climax of the Wano arc. Now the other major point that needs to be addressed is Sanji's gag. This is where I think there may be some legitimate lack of general, total lack of awareness on Oda's part, and I have no idea if this is going to change anytime soon. So more and more since the time skip, I have personally felt that Sanji's gag has crossed the line over to just being plain obnoxious, and I don't think I'm alone as I do see lots of readers complaining that a big part of Sanji's of the problem of Sanji's post time skip portrayal is that Oda is making him look bad over and over and basically be the butt of cheap jokes repeatedly, with the nosebleeds being particularly annoying. Now, obviously I can't prove to you what is funny 
or not funny. Maybe you find post time skips Sanji to be hilarious. That's fine. Here, I'm just going to address why a lot of readers may not like it. And what it really comes down to is that there has been a change between what Sanji's gag actually was pre time skip to what it has become post time skip, and why I think the gag worked better in general pre time skip. So, let's go back to square one without thinking about anything that has happened post time skip. What was the initial concept of Sanji's gag at its core? Well, Sanji could very easily have been simply written as this suave, you know, clever, well dressed James Bond type badass character. And that's a character type you see in many other series. The gag that Oda wrote is simply that all of this immediately vanishes the moment he's in front of a woman. He goes straight from being one of the coolest and smartest members of the crew to the undisputed stupidest and lamest. I personally think that's a good gag on paper, you know, making Sanji a love struck idiot only specifically when it comes to women, because it's a sharp contrast to what you normally see of him and what you would normally expect of Sanji's character type. And I thought that came out really well in many ways throughout the pre time skip. Like, even in just, you know, this simple scene with Luffy, where they're having this conversation about snow, and Luffy is going on about ridiculous myths he's heard about people who live in snowy islands. And of course, Sanji is much too smart for that sort of a thing, so he, a very intelligent, rational person, is explaining to Luffy, an absolute idiot, why this makes no sense. The joke, is that immediately afterwards we find out that Sanji, despite being such a logical, intelligent person, believes something even stupider than Luffy simply because he's that dumb, specifically when it comes to women. So it's not obnoxious in any way, it's actually a great bit of extended back and forth dialogue for a comedy scene, with a nice setup and punchline in my opinion. And of course we can see the gag happen in more blatant ways, such as Sanji having arguably his coolest moment in the entire series as Mr. Prince and then Oda suddenly completely flipping that on its head the very next page by reminding us that he is an idiot at his core. Similarly, seeing Sanji go into a never before seen over the top, literally fiery rage when he finds out that someone else is getting to live out his fantasies, getting to marry Nami and being able to turn invisible, works in my opinion as it's allowing us to see a completely new set of reactions from Sanji by giving him a fresh situation to play off of. And along those lines, a whole different side to the gag also opens up from the fact that as someone who cares a lot about women, he naturally cares a lot about what they think of him as well. So Sanji's image is extremely, extremely important to him. That means that moments where that image is shattered can make for great comedy moments as well. Sanji has easily the best bounty reveal in the entire series, and it only works because it's Sanji who would naturally care the most about his image. And on top of that, in my opinion, the single best, most brilliantly built up gag in the entire series the Duval reveal is only possible because Sanji cares so much about his appearance in the first place and would by far have the angriest reaction to this situation. So generally, whether you find his gag funny or not, I do think that pre time skip Oda did a good job timing it well for moments that highlighted the contrast between Sanji's cool side and his lame side and also did a good job mixing it up and finding new angles to make a joke with it. So what changed post time skip? Well, first of all, I think one crucial aspect that has been lost is that contrast. Again, the joke is that there is this character who seems really cool in many ways, but is also unbelievably lame in this one specific way. That contrast is what's funny. But as I talked about in the previous section, it's felt like Sanji post time skip hasn't gotten as many of those big, memorable badass moments or those extended solo plot lines that remind readers how cool he can be. When a character is not getting as many highlight moments or scenes as they once were, but the amount of times they're being made the butt of the joke is the same or maybe even increasing, then it can start to feel like the author is disrespecting the character or enjoying making fun of them. And again, this is where I think it may just be genuine lack of awareness by Oda. I think he just finds his Sanji jokes funny and he doesn't quite realize how long it's been since he's given us the scenes that counterbalance that. So I think this sense of contrast will at least hopefully come back once Oda does deliver on positive Sanji moments that readers have been waiting for. So this aspect of the problem can be rectified. But what I think has definitely changed potentially more permanently is also the overall nature of the gag itself. Pre time skip, Sanji turned into an idiot around women and would do anything to please them. That was the joke. But ever since the time skip, the joke has pretty much just shifted to become Sanji's a weird pervert. It's mostly just that over and over again. Look, Sanji's really perverted. He's really perverted. He's so perverted, it's basically a medical condition. 
It kind of seems like we at least get past the nosebleeds after Fishman Island, but not really. And yes, Sanji was always a little perverted pre-time skip, but that wasn't the main part of his gag that Oda was really playing up. That was just, that was one aspect of it that happened to exist. Like, yeah, pre-time skip Sanji did like to see skimpily dressed women. If he had things his way, that would always be the case, but it was never anything too crazy or too frequent. And in fact, it wasn't even too far out of line from the other guys in the group. I think around Thriller Bark, with the introduction of Sanji's true dream to have the invisibility fruit so that he could peep, the seed was planted for Sanji's primary gag to change to become more about him being a pervert. And for the record, I personally found this specific joke funny at the time just due to the absurdity of it, but now I kind of hate it because I think this might be when Oda started thinking, you know, this idea is just really funny all the time. He started gradually writing pervert jokes more often until instead of the gag being that Sanji is a cool guy who's lame with women, the joke is just that Sanji's a weird pervert. And that's a very, very important difference. I'm not going to act like the pre-time skip gag of, you know, cool shonen character who's actually a total idiot with girls is brilliant writing, but at least it's a fun twist on a commonly seen character type. On the other hand, when the joke is literally just that this character is a pervert, I think that's pretty much one of the most generic, low-hanging fruit gags that you can center a character around. It's pretty one note, and I generally don't think there's a lot you can even do with the gag because Oda has been trying, like he has technically found lots of fresh situations to put Sanji into, you know, having Sanji find paradise with the mermaid cove, being put into Nami's body, getting, the invis getting an invisibility suit. Yet, I still feel like I'm getting the same joke over and over again, and it's a joke I already personally think is pretty generic in the first place. Again, compared to pre-time skip, where I think Oda was able to get a lot of different punchlines and sets of reactions from different situations, and generally could write more extended comedy bits, where you don't see the punchline that it's actually setting up for, now I feel this modern day gag doesn't lend itself to any of that. The joke is mostly just that, look, Sanji is turned on about something, or look, he's disappointed that he didn't get what he wanted. So, I think Sanji's gag has gone backwards in two ways. First, we get much less of the suave, cool, intelligent Sanji, meaning the contrast between Sanji the badass and Sanji the idiot feels less sharp. And second, it's not even really Sanji the idiot anymore, it's just Sanji the pervert weirdo. And I really don't know if Oda is ever going to change this. I thought he had shifted hard away from that as of Whole Cake Island, where Sanji's perversion during that arc was actually pretty much completely taken out of the picture. But in Wano, that gag has been back in pretty much full force. I think Oda just thinks it's a funny gag now and he's going to be sticking with it. So rather than hoping that it's just going to be gone from the story in the future, we can more so hope the frequency will at least decrease whenever the story gets more serious as it did during Whole Cake Island. So that's all for this video. If you enjoyed, then definitely like, share, and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts on the comments below. And you can support me on Patreon to help me make more videos in the future. Link in the description below.